Um, well, Keith, um, who is Keith Gessen? Um, so uh, a literary enemy of Keith once described him as uh, having the soulful looks of a Greenwich Village bohemian and the oh-so-erotic arrogance of a Russian Jewish intellectual. <laughs> so there's, um, there's a lot to unpack tonight. Um, but he, he also writes books and, uh, and, and has two ch children with, with Russian names. And he uh, co-founded a very well-known um, brand of tote bags called N plus One. Um, you might have seen. There are young people carrying these around. You might have seen them. Um, so uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot going on here. Um, and just a quick recap. So Keith was born, and, and correct me if I'm wrong um, on any of these and, and intervenes here, born in Moscow to a family of uh, Soviet intellectuals. Uh, but then you, you, you sort of reinvented yourself as an all-American football player at Harvard, which mm -hmm. to me didn't make sense uh, for a long time until we found out about how American Ivy League admissions work. And um, <laughs> if anyone has uh, questions about, about that and how much it costs Keith, there's a Q&A at, at the end. Um, after that, you did an MFA program. Uh, you were taught by George Saunders. Um, but according to my sources on Wikipedia, um, Keith did not actually at the time get a degree because he failed to submit an original work of fiction um, which I think is a harsh way of describing uh, your debut novel, uh, Sad, Well, the Sad Young Literary Man. I liked it, um, maybe somebody here too. Um, but whatever we think about that, your second book, A Terrible Country, is an altogether different uh, level. It is um, a deeply felt, it, is, um, it asks very uncomfortable questions about ourselves. Uh, the title is trolling us because we think it's, it's about how bad Russia is, but actually, uh, we, we find out that um, a lot of things close to us are, are actually very pro problematic. Um, and, and that's what makes it so engaged, and that's what makes it so um, important at a time like this. And, and i just like to say that I think these qualities that, that, that are in that book, that those qualities of empathy, um, a reviewer described it as astute but goofy. I, I, I think it's astute and empathetic and, and also critical, and so this is the reporting that you did from, from Ukraine in the war that was so important. Um, talking to the losers, so-called, in the East, who were breaking away and really asking them real questions about what motivates them when people weren't asking those questions. And you weren't just doing it to write it down and say how, how crazy their opinions were. You did it to really interrogate maybe our own complicity in that and, and the, the reason people are motivated to do the things that they're doing. So um, I just wanted to say all of this makes it such an honor to have you here today for us to, to talk. Um, I also realized that I've been relentlessly positive about Keith, but actually there's so much compromise about him. Um, if you want to read about that, it's on the internet. Um, <laughs> here we go. Thank you, Vadim. I did not realize until now that it is you who are my literary enemy. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you to the brave Fitzgeraldo Editions Press for bringing me over. Uh, over the pond. I don't get over here very much, so this is uh, really exciting, and, and it's an honor to be here at the LRB Bookshop, one of the great bookshops of the world. Um, so I'm going to read uh, from, from the book a little bit. Um, I'm going to read something I haven't read before, but uh, somehow or other I was inspired, um, uh, partly at my wife Emily's suggestion, to read from the clog section. Um, a little background. Um, the book is about a, a failed academic um, who goes over to Moscow in 2008 to take care of his grandmother. Um, uh, uh, his brother, who's a sort of swashbuckling capitalist entrepreneur, uh, talks him into it um, because he himself, Dima, uh, needs to leave town for a little bit until things quiet down. Um, so Andre, the narrator, goes over uh, somewhat reluctantly, uh, but he thinks that um, uh, once he's there, he can find some material for an academic article, which will then help him get a job uh, back in the States. Um, he initially thinks he's going to interview his grandmother about uh, her life under the Soviets, and that this will provide uh, the material for his academic article. Uh, it quickly emerges his grandmother doesn't remember anything. Um, she's losing her memory. She's losing her hearing. Um, Andre is uh, frustrated. He feels like he's in over his head. Um, he thinks he should go, go back, but um, partly 
um, out of kind of sympathy for his grandmother, partly just to spite his brother. Uh, he stays. Um, he finally meets some people. He meets some um, guys that he plays hockey with. He meets some socialist activists who he finds inspiring. Um, meanwhile, his brother is conspiring to sell the apartment in which um, his grandmother has been living for many years. Um, and uh, at this point in the novel, the narrator has said no to Dima. He said, no, we will not sell the apartment. I won't let you sell the apartment. Um, but he doesn't really have a, a plan for how to proceed from there. So um, that brings us to the clog chapter. It's called, My Grandmother Throws a Party. It was finally spring. The snow melted and for a few weeks everything was muddy, but the sun shone and it was warm and my grandmother and I started going for walks again. I had rejected Dima's plan to sell the apartment on instinct. Beyond that, I didn't really know what to do. If I was going to stay here, Yulia and I should try to move in together. Um, Yulia is his girlfriend. Katya is her roommate, like literally her roommate. They live in the same room, they sleep on the same bed, um, but they take turns doing it. Um, they don't have a lot of money. I could displace Katya and move into Yulia's room, but that was the room she lived in with Shapalkin before they broke up. A bad idea. She could come live with me and my grandmother and I could replace the bunk beds or just place them side by side. But as Yulia had thus far not even agreed to sleep over, this was maybe a stretch. I walked up and down the boulevard with my grandmother trying to figure it out. Her 90th birthday was coming up. I wasn't sure how she felt about celebrating it, but a few days after the blow up with Dima, she turned to me and said, you know, I'm about to turn 100. Well, almost, I said, you're about to turn 90. How's that, she said. Well, what year were you born? In 1919, she said, and now it's 2009, so that makes you 90. My grandmother looked at me unconvinced. Maybe, she said. <laughs> Either way, it seemed like a big deal, and I decided we should throw a party. I made sure Emma Bravovna, that's the grandmother's best friend, could come on that day and I invited Yulia and her roommates, our reading group, and Sergei, as well as the soldiers. I've invited some people to come over on your birthday, I told my grandmother. You have? But how will we, how will we feed them? He said, Afima Mikhailovna will make a nice meal for them, I said. My grandmother agreed, but she did not quite agree. The next day in the late morning, she started getting dressed to go out. I need to get some things for the birthday party, she said. Like what, I said. All sorts of things, said my grandmother. I decided to go with her, and together we walked to the market. The ground was a little wet still from the melting snow, but the sun was out. It was nice. At the market, my grandmother headed for the baked goods. Do you think the guests want this pie, she said, pointing to her favorite poppy seed pie. Maybe, I said, but the party is two weeks away. Why don't we buy it a little closer then so it's fresher? Let's buy it now so we don't have to worry about it, said my grandmother. I decided not to argue. And the next day, I did not accompany her as she went again to get more birthday supplies. I watched her from her bedroom window as she slowly but surely made her way, sometimes leaning on her cane and other times ignoring it, out of the courtyard and toward the market. The birthday party was inspiring my grandmother to leave the house. I wasn't going to argue with that, even if some of the things she was bringing back, for example, grapes, we're not going to make it. Sometimes I ended up eating the food she bought. Other times she would eat it herself, forgetting why she'd bought it. I began to think of it as more of a two-week birthday feast than a waste of energy. And why not? You only turn 90 once, especially if you think you're turning 100. <laughs> <laughs> when the day of the party finally arrived, I got up in the morning and sent out a reminder email to all the guests. I also called and talked with Emma Abramovna and her caretaker, Valya, to make sure they were still coming. By this point, Emma Abramovna had received numerous calls on the subject from my grandmother. I'm turning 100, my grandmother would say. Pause. No, I am. I did the math. Another pause. Are you sure? How old are you? Emma Abramovna was 87. Really? said my grandmother, surprised. She couldn't be 13, older, 13 years older than Emma Abramovna. After emailing everyone, I ate some breakfast and began doing the dishes. I noticed that the water wasn't draining. This had happened before, but it had responded well to my jamming it with a plunger. I did this now, and it seemed to get better, but when I went into the bathroom, the sink there wasn't draining. They were connected, these sinks, and I had merely shifted the problem from one to the other. I now plungered the bathroom sink. 
The water drained, but when I returned to the kitchen, it didn't drain again. At this point, my grandmother came into the kitchen and saw that something was wrong. Andrush, what's the matter? The sink is clogged, but we'll unclog it. Do you know how? Yes, I said, and went into my room. I did not know how. It was now 10 o'clock. Serafima Mikhailovna was coming at noon and the guests at five. We were in trouble. I called Dima's handyman, Stepan. He picked up on the second ring. I'm in Irkutsk, he said, visiting family. You're an educated person. You'll figure it out. There's a snake under the sink. Use that. Thanks, I said. No problem, said Stepan, and hung up. Stepan's confidence in me, however ironic, propelled me back into the kitchen. My grandmother had taken a seat and was now preparing to watch me defeat the clog. I had noticed a few times while going under the sink to fetch a rag to wipe the floor that there was a device back there that looked like a thick coiled water, which I thought might be a sink implement of some kind. I took it out now. It was a coiled wire with a kind of winding mechanism. This was the snake. You stuck it in the sink and wound it until it came up against your clog. But the kitchen sink drain was covered by a metal grate that was soldered to the sink bottom. I couldn't get the snake in there. Was there another way in? I went again under the sink. The water drained into the wall through segmented plastic pipes. There was a pipe running straight down from the sink, which connected to a U-shaped pipe, which in turn connected to a pipe that ran into the wall. Three pipes in all. But why would they make the water travel through a U, that is, down and then up again before going into the wall? Maybe that was the problem. The U was blocked. At least the U looked like it would come off. It was attached to the other two pipes with round cu coupling nuts. I tried them. Lefty Lucy, they turned. I undid one nut and the U-shaped segment detached ever so slightly from the pipe going into the wall. Now I unscrewed the other nut, and just like that, the U-shaped pipe came off. Suddenly, a cascade of water came down onto me from the sink pipe. I jumped back and out of the space and spilled water from the U-shaped pipe onto the floor. The water was nasty, brackish. I took my U-shaped pipe and dumped it in the toilet. Then I came back and started rounding up rags to clean up the spill. My grandmother was aghast. How horrible, she said. How terrible. What are we going to do? We're finished. Are we finished? I tried not to lose my cool. After all, my grandmother wasn't wrong. I was covered in filth, and I had, just dis I had just dismembered the sink without any clear plan of action. I was ignorant of plumbing. I was ignorant of the entire physical world. I lived in an apartment, but how had they built this apartment? What materials were in it? Why did it keep out the cold? How did heat enter it? How did water? And where did the water from the sink go after it made it through these plastic pipes? Andrush, said my grandmother, should we cancel the party? <laughs> I looked at my worried grandmother. She had stopped dressing up at home and mostly wore her worn-out pink robe, but she still wanted to have a party. I could see that. We're okay, I lied. I know what I'm doing. Give me an hour, okay? If I don't fix this in an hour, we can cancel the party. My grandmother agreed and went to lie down in her room. I returned to the sink. I had been reading Marx a man who had tried to examine every minute piece of socioeconomic detail in order to discover the laws whereby capitalist society functioned. But was there a Marx of the physical world? There was actually Newton. In the 17th century, Newton had discovered the basic laws of motion, inertia, gravity, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Where previously people had simply seen things fall, now they could understand why they fell. In fact, it was less that less that Newton was the Marx of the physical world than that Marx was trying to be the Newton of the social world. Had he succeeded? Maybe not. The laws of economics were, were more complicated than the laws of motion. I considered calling Yulia to ask if she knew anything about sinks, but it was my sense that she did not know anything about sinks. And Sergei was probably teaching a class somewhere. Not that he would know much about sinks. Of the Octoberists, Nikolai would, be, would have the best chance of knowing about sinks, but calling him now would be an implicit promise to help him again with his stupid dacha. Also, I had not invited him to the party, but I wiped my hands on a towel and dialed his number. He did not pick up. I went back to the sink. The simplest thing would have been if the U was clogged. I had spilled water out of it, but that didn't mean there wasn't a clog in there. I looked inside and saw darkness. I took the U into the bath and poured some water into it from the lower faucet. The water went into the U and very quickly started coming out the other side. The U was not clogged. I returned to the kitchen only to find my grandmother going through her little phone book. Andrush, she said, we have to call everyone and tell them not to come. Why, I said. Well, look, she said, indicating the sink. The area around the sink was terrifying. 
filthy rags soaked in water, a mess of cleaning products in old plastic bags, the little red doors under the sink opened to reveal that someone had torn apart the pipes. I could see why, why my grandmother might think we weren't ready to receive guests. You said you'd give me an hour, I said. Only 20 minutes have passed. I can fix this. I shooed her back into her room. Then I put our deepest saucepan under the sink, poured some water into a glass, and started pouring it down the drain. It appeared without delay on the other end of the pipe and splashed into my sink, into my saucepan. So there was nothing wrong with the sink or its pipe, and there was nothing wrong with the U-pipe. That left the pipe sticking into the wall. I took my glass with water and angled some into that pipe. In it went, but I could not see the other side. The other side was... I had no idea where. Outdoors? Under the apartment? I mean, both. The answer had to be both. The pipes must have been in between the walls and the floors, eventually connecting to a larger pipe under the street. That was the only possibility. And the pipes from the street went, I did not know. That was beyond my pay grade. Into the river? It didn't matter. I just had to clear this one clog. I stuck the snake into the wall pipe and started turning the handle. At first, there was no resistance, and then there was a little, but I kept turning the handle, and my wire went deeper. Had I cleared the clog, or were these bends in the pipe? I suspected bends and kept going. I was shocked at the length of the wire. There was no way to know just how quickly I was uncoiling it, and I couldn't, of course, measure, but it must have extend extended more than 15 feet. And then it ran into something that stopped it cold, a wall of some kind, or a rock. At first, I thought that this was it the end of the pipe. If this was the end of the pipe, and I had not yet met the clog, then I was up against a mystery. Or else I had simply cleared it and not really noticed. That's how strong the snake was. I started withdrawing the snake. I'd have to put the pipes back together and test the sink again. Except, what would it mean for the pipe to end? I stopped withdrawing the snake. The pipe couldn't end. If the pipe ended, where would the water go? No, no, no. Our pipe must have cleared into a larger pipe, pipe, which eventually cleared and into an even larger pipe than that out on the street, like I said. That's the only way this thing could have kept going. If my snake had entered a larger pipe, why would it have stopped? No, 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 no. I started turning my snake again in the old forward direction until it, until it returned to the rock. This time, I kept going. If there was a rock in my pipe, I needed to get it out of the way. And as I turned the snake, I felt, or thought I felt, that the rock was moving. I might also have been twisting without effect, and yet it felt like something was happening. I kept turning, and by now I was convinced, although at times it seemed immovable, that this was not a rock, but a clog. My clog. A coil of hair and vegetables and shampoo and kasha. As I pressed against it, I imagined what it looked like, this coil of hair and kasha. I was amazed that any water had managed to penetrate it at all, but then again, water has its waves, and also, actually, the whole point was that it had stopped penetrating it. That's why I was here. And then it suddenly, it felt like my clog had fallen into space, and my snake was free. I turned the handle a few more times, but it was unnecessary. The clog was gone. I just knew it. Motherfucking clog! I wished I had been able to see its face as it fell into the larger pipe to be swept into a river and then eventually an ocean or whatever. Fuck you, clog! <laughs> My only regret is that I didn't look upon your ugly face. <laughs> I reassembled the pipes under the sink, turned on the water, and watched it drain. I had never been so impressed. The simple draining of water in a sink had never seemed to me so elegant. Babushka, I said. My grandmother was in her room, and when I went to, in there to get her, I, she was looking out the window into the courtyard. Babushka, let me show you something. I led her back to the kitchen. Oh my God, she cried after seeing the mess on the floor, which I hadn't yet cleaned up. No, look, I said, and I turned the water on. It drained perfectly. I was worried that she'd forgotten about the whole thing as, and was going to ask what I was showing her, but she hadn't. You fixed it, she said. I nodded. I knew you would, she said, and went back to her room. A little while later, my phone rang. It was Nikolai. What's up, he said. Oh, nothing. I wanted to consult you about a plumbing issue, but I fixed it. You fixed the plumbing? I did. Good for you, said Nikolai. There was a pause. I sensed that he knew that there was a party and that I hadn't invited him. So I invited him. 
I'd be glad to come, said Nikolai. Soon, Serafima Mikhailovna came and cooked a monumental feast. Then the guests started arriving. Emma Abramovna came with her caretaker and the soldiers, plus Howard's very nice and pretty girlfriend, and the Octoberists. My line mates, Anton and Oleg, represented the hockey guys. I hadn't realized until now, uh, until they filled up my grandmother's ancient apartment, just how big they were. The party was not without its ticklish moments. Misha demanded of Oleg what he did for a living, and when Oleg answered that he was in real estate, Misha asked if that meant he sucked the marrow from the life of the city. That's right, said Oleg happily. Misha was momentarily flustered by Oleg's amor amorality, but then just hit, raised his glass to him. You are my enemy, and you know it, he said. They got along great after that. There was plenty of alcohol at the party and plenty of food. I hadn't realized it before, but Anton and Katya were both single, and at the end of the night, he asked for her number. For dinner, we set everything up in the back room and put my grandmother in a spot from which she wouldn't be able to get up and try to fetch people things. She accepted this. I worried that she would start hinting to Emma Abramovna about her dacha, and everyone would see how her oldest friend evaded her, but she never brought it up. Periodis periodically, she would ask, when there was a quiet moment, whose party is this? At first, it was worrisome, but then it almost seemed like she was teasing us. It's your party, we said, and she said, my party? And we said, yes. All right, she agreed. She stayed with us until the guests left at close to midnight and then declared, as she watched Yulia and me finish the cleanup, that we were never having guests again. It was too exhausting. But she said it in a triumphant sort of way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was, um, thank you for listening to that. <laughs> Um, I, I had prepared some questions, but I'm really not sure if they're... Um, <laughs> well, you know, Knausgaard, like, apparently, I, haven't, I, I've, I admit I haven't read the Knausgaard books, but apparently the first one opens with like 50 pages of him cleaning an apartment. <laughs> you know, sorry? Well, I, yeah, so I thought if, if Knausgaard can do 50 pages on, you know, I can do five pages on a clog, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. Well, that's... Um, uh, Let's talk about socialism. Um, you, um, <laughs> you know, um, you, um, <laughs> there's a lot of it in the book, and uh, you were one of the first people to, to be there on Occupy Wall Street um, talking about that stuff, and then kind of no one was listening for a while, and then now everyone's talking about it, and mm -hmm. the book, I, I got the sense, I don't know if the clog was a metaphor. I'm just going to try to work it in here somewhere. Um, but the idea was that um, you, you, the character went to Russia. He thought, oh, my God, I'm going to meet dictatorship. That would be the enemy. And then he kind of realized that actually it's capitalism that's the enemy. That's the kind of enemy of human freedom and, and human empathy. And, um, and all of a sudden, the problem became, started from being particular to Russia to be, being a universal one that concerns a much broader uh, issue. And um, well, first of all, I, I wanted to, to ask you about that. Um, first of all, I mean, how smug do you feel about having kind of been there as, as an early adopter of this sort of thing? And two, uh, do you think, I mean, if we want to use like N plus one words, you know, like praxis, what do we do uh, with that realization? Where do we take it? How do we, um, how do we unclog the sink of, uh, of, of, of international <laughs> politics? Wow. Uh-huh. Um, uh, was that okay? With, uh, yeah, I don't know with, what to uh, do. with the snake, with the snake of our uh, critique. Um, yes. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, so um, I, I, you know, I, I, um, I do identify uh, as a democratic socialist. Um, it was actually, it was actually my experience um, with Russia that that made you know that kind of pushed me to the left. I, I started going over there in the mid '90s. Um, uh, when I went over there, kind of like Andre in the book. Um, I mostly had, had been reading kind of the mainstream press, and, and I thought the problem with Russia was that it was stuck in its Soviet past, right? Um, and, um, you know, that was the explanation in the 90s, and to this day, often, um, when people talk about Putin, for example, they talk about him as a kind of relic of the Soviet past. Um, but in the 90s, when Russia was going through a lot of turmoil where people were um, being thrown out of work when they were losing their life savings, when they were um, committing suicide in record numbers. Um, people would say, well, 
it's all the Soviets' fault, right? Um, and I, I had no reason to disbelieve that. And then I went over there in uh, the first time it was 1995, and then I was there a bunch in the 90s. And you know what I saw was um, just capitalism kind of run amok, right? Um, and you know the whole country had been kind of uh, opened up to the global marketplace, and you know the the kind of main impression of uh, Russia in the 90s were uh, currency exchanges, right? Everywhere you went, there were currency exchanges. Um, I'd never seen, you know, I'd, I don't know that I'd ever seen a currency exchange except at an airport, right? But in Moscow, they were, you know, every kind of 10 meters, there was a currency exchange. And the reason was the ruble had collapsed, right? It was so unstable. As soon as you got some uh, money, some rubles, you would change it to dollars. And as soon as you had to buy something, you would have to change it back to rubles, right? So people were just constantly exchanging money. And, and being in the currency exchange business was uh, a good idea. Um, there were guys in leather jackets and... Um, and uh, uh, train, training suits, uh, you know, um, jogging suits, right? Which was a weird kind of sartorial uh, combination, I, I thought. Um, but then I, I later kind of read about it, and I understood that um, the jackets were to kind of communicate that you were a gangster, right? And the uh, the jog, you know, the, the jogging suit was to kick people in the head, right? Because <laughs> jeans are like bad, you know. It's just you don't you don't get enough flexibility in your leg to kick people in the head. Um, so that's you know so and, and I was like oh this is not this this is not the Soviet inheritance right this is what actually what capitalism looks like um, if you if you don't have you know hundreds of years of accumulated wealth so that was kind of the that was my journey and it took me like you know it took like so Andre kind of goes through that in about six months <laughs> right and it took me about ten years you know uh, to understand all that. Um, but and you know that's fic that's what fiction is for, right? Mm. Your character can kind of travel that um, route faster, um, and you know, and kind of going to Russia and seeing that, and then coming back to the states, um, it gave me a kind of different way of of kind of just a different lens of of seeing what was happening there, right? Um, and you know, of a, a capitalism that in the states it 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 does look. I mean, it's funny to say that in Europe, but I mean, it, it does look certainly more benevolent than in Russia, right? I mean, there are more rules. Um, if you talk to people who are in business, they kind of imagine themselves um, living by a kind of ethics, right? Um, but in fact, you know, um, it's, it's quite destructive, right? Um, and, uh, and it's quite brutal, right? And so um, it's, it's not an answer to your question, but, but that, I mean, so I, I learned that by going to Russia, right? And it's, it does seem to me right now that um, I mean, one way that Russia, I mean, I, I feel like Russia and the U.S. have always moved in somewhat parallel kind of political um, trajectories um, right now more, more than ever, right? And, um, you know, for me, the kind of thing that people have not ever understood very well about Trump, about, sorry, about Putin but I'll get to Trump in, in a second. Um, uh, but it, no, but it is, it, it is the one way it, it, I think that uh, Putin does actually resemble Trump is, is in the kind of people who vote for him, right? In the, in the kind of composition and the motivation of the people who vote for him. Putin um, is an answer to the trauma of the post-Soviet transition, right? Um, which you've written about a great deal, right? It's, um, you know, the, the, the really brutal rapacious um, uh, transition where, where millions of people were, were left behind, right? And um, Putin is a kind of answer to that. Um, Putin speaks to that. Um, and we don't really understand Russia unless we understand that that's what's happening. That's what people want to talk about. Um, I think Trump, in a similar way, is talking to people who were left behind. Um, by the kind of post-industrialization of the United States, um, he's not—he's uh, not the right answer, right? Uh, but he does speak to people who are looking for that answer. So, in that way, um, Putin and Trump are similar. I, I'm not going to presume to tell you that that's the case in Britain as well, um, but maybe uh, mm -hmm. in terms of Brexit. Well, um, yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I, 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 I could feel in the book um, that there is this under, underlayer also of nostalgia that, 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 that goes through the way 
um, and kind of uh, counterintuitively sometimes because you know people who didn't much like the Soviet Union, like your uh, um, narrator's grandmother, mm -hmm. um, nevertheless uh, ha has a kind of nostalgia for something. Um, you know, when she watched that movie, and there was a, a moment in the book um, uh, where um, the narrator Andre like, keeps trying to take his his grandmother to movies that he thinks she would like. And all these new movies, and she doesn't like any of them. And he thinks, like, why doesn't she like? She likes the person that she likes the poet. The movie is about. She like, but she doesn't. And then she he ends up showing her this 1970s Soviet film, and uh, and she finally uh, connects with it because she recognizes Leningrad and all these other movies about St. Petersburg. And it's a place that's just not her, not her town. And um, and despite all of the difficulties that she went through under under so Soviet um, uh, under the Soviets, she she connects with that. So I wanted to kind of ask, do you, I mean, you were six years old when you left, you come back, I, I uh, but there is this complication that your parents left as um, refugees. Um, uh, does nostalgia uh, fit in, in with your work? Do you feel that there is a, a nostalgia uh, that's, that's problematic in, in, in the way we think about Russia and the Soviet Union? And how do you personally like connect with that? I, I was just curious because I, I I'm very nostalgic for stuff. Um, for the Soviet Union? Yeah, actually, it was, I mean, if I can remember, I mean, I, like you, I'm a new parent, and I, I was like, our kid is seven months old, and he's the first member of my family that's not a Soviet person, and it was crazy to me. Um, and I didn't know how to deal with that, and one of the ways I dealt with it is trying to do, like, I don't know if you saw Goodbye Lenin. Um, I'm trying to, like, he has all Soviet children's books. I bought him a Soviet synthesizer. I bought myself a Soviet synthesizer. He can play with it. Um, so maybe when he turns 18, he's going to be like, Dad, you never told me that, like, it's not there anymore. Um, but that's maybe not the most constructive way of dealing with it. Like, how, how have you dealt with that? And, and yeah, like, what does all this mean? Um, yeah, it's complicated. I mean, so the, the, the grandmother, who is based on my own grandmother, um, who I lived with for a year in Moscow, um, in the period in which it described in the book. Um, yeah, she hated the Soviet Union, right? In, in the book, she hates the Soviet Union. She's very happy that it fell apart. Um, and yet, right, um, she loses her life savings. She loses her dacha. Her husband loses his job at the Research Institute. Um, more, but, you know, uh, more than that, the kind of role of the Soviet Union in constructing meaning Right, whether it was for people who liked the Soviet Union or for people who hated the Soviet Union, um, you know, the kind of disappearance of that um, sort of meaning creator in her life, um, I think, was very difficult. Right, um, and you know, a lot of the values that the Soviet Union proclaimed, um, which mostly were you know honored in the breach. Right, I mean, um, but but still, yeah, well, well, you know, like uh, equality. Um, you know, uh, internationalism, right? Um, you know, just, I mean, and... and Looking the, after the weak or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, um, yes. Uh, uh, that, that was valuable Books, people. the value of books, right? No one cares was, about books It anymore. was a very uh, logocentric uh, site. Yes. Um, I mean, that was... People, that meant something to people even if they thought they really wanted the regime to collapse, right? And so that was... Um, uh, that's very complicated, right? I don't know, you know, I don't know if my grandmother would ever have said, I want the Soviet Union to come back, right? But there was a lot about the Soviet Union that um, for her actually turned out to be very valuable. Um, and I don't, I don't know that she ever would have admitted just how screwed she got um, by the kind of transition, right? But she really did. Um, I mean, that's kind of, that's part of the tragedy of the, um, Part of the tragedy of the post-Soviet reforms is how many people said, "Oh, great! You know, this is this is as it should be, right? Um, I'm going to be immiserated. I'm going to be put out of a job. My life savings will evaporate, but that's historically necessary, right? For us to have a new Russia, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and they never got their new Russia, right? It never it hasn't mm -hmm. happened. Uh, or, or, is that or somebody told Sultan Alexievich, we felt that there were buses waiting for us." Engines revving to take us to democracy. Right. And then, you know, right. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, the, the kind of this dream of, you know, turning Russia into a kind of prosperous, normal European country, um, people really suffered for that. And, and at the end, um, they, they don't have it. So that's, that's, uh, that's sad. And, you know, I mean, the, the, there's a kind of a, a bit in the book about the liberals. Um, 
and the narrator very, feels very turned off by the kind of post-Soviet Russian Yeah, what's, wrong, what's wrong with those assholes? Well, um, I mean, <laughs> I, it, it's, it's mostly their attitude toward people who um, see any value in, in this, the country that they lost, right? I mean, they think those people are, they, call, they have a dismissive word, savok, mm -hmm. right? It's people who are, um, you know, uh, irrationally, stupidly, uneducatedly attached um, to this place that was a mistake, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, I feel like we in the United States uh, employ that rhetoric a great deal when talking about Trump supporters, right? And in fact, I, you know, I, I can see it very easily in the Russian case because I'm not, it's not my place, right? And I, so I can see, I'm like, you were talking about my grandmother, you know, or you were, you were talking about people who deserve more respect than this. Um, in the United States, I feel the same way about Trump supporters. I'm very angry at them, right? So it's easier to see in other countries. Um, mm -hmm. But when I think about it, I'm like, oh, we, we employ the same rhetoric, of, or the, sorry, the same dehumanizing uh, rhetoric. These people are, are dead enders, you know? Um, and yeah, that, that makes you an asshole. You know, when, when, when you find yourself um, being dismissive um, and you know cruel to people who are less educated than you, who have fewer opportunities, right? Uh, they might have some lousy opinions, but but uh, they're in a much worse situation than you are. Um, that's you may you may be an asshole. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah um, we're gonna open up um, to to questions, but mm -hmm. I, I had a question uh, just very briefly for you. Um, uh, before we do that, is um, so, so you, you've been arrested twice, um, maybe more, I, I'm not sure. Um, but, but one time was, was in America, and one mm -hmm. time was in Russia. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, what did you enjoy better? And, um, <laughs> and yeah, can you, tell us, can you tell us about that? Um, that's interesting. I mean, I spent, uh, I was arrested at, at, um, at the, during the Sochi mayoral election in 2009. Um, I was covering the campaign of Boris Nemtsov. Um, who had gone down there because he uh, had grown up in Sochi and he wanted to kind of um, see if he could, you know, make some waves by, uh, he was a, by then a very strong anti-Putin um, figure. Uh, he eventually got shot uh, in 2015 uh, right in front of the Kremlin. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, got, a, I got detained because uh, I didn't have my proper registration. Um, and uh, I was kept there for not that long, four hours. Um, but it was a very, um, you know, and I, it's actually kind of the basis for the arrest in the book, right? That feeling of, um, I can't leave. I'm not allowed to leave, right? We're sitting, it was, it was much more informal than my American arrest. In, in America, they had a, you know, they were like, they book you, they take your stuff, you sign for it, they put you in a cell with a bunch of other people, and you're going to get out in like 24 hours, and it's, you know. It's kind of, in Russia, it was like we had some tea, <laughs> we sat around the table, people would come and, come and go, and, but like the weird, you know, they could go, and I could not. Um, and, and that was, I didn't like that feeling. I didn't, I didn't enjoy that. So I didn't enjoy either of them very much. Um, but the Russian one felt a little um, weirder, and like um, it could go, and any, anything, could really, anything could happen. Um, so... Yeah, but uh, no, but but yeah, I recommend it. Having, having said that, um, I recommend seeing what it's like. Well, on, on that note, um, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Keith. And um, yeah, questions, um, please. Uh, over. Here. Got a microphone. Oh. So. Mm. You talked about the Soviet Union having a narrative and a narrative of meaning for people. We know um, currently the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, talking about the narrative of kindness and compassion and empathy as her political touch points. Do you think, while that's really beautiful, to be honest, and I can say this because I come from that part of the world, she is a country of four million people on the other side, an isolated part of the planet. Sometimes that comes across as naive, sometimes that comes across as inspirational. Do you think her narrative of a kind of politics is something that's realistic for the rest of the world in places like Russia and Britain and the US? Um, I, I don't know. Um, but I, you know, I do, you know, I mean, um, uh, we, we tend to be 
well, we, we sometimes tend to be dismissive of politicians' rhetoric, right? But to, um, I mean, what, you know, one of the, I don't think Putin, to bring this back to kind of Russia, I don't think Putin is a, I don't think he wants to reconstruct the Soviet Union, right? I don't think, um, I don't think he has a lot of nostalgia for a place where everybody was kind of walking around in the same pair of pants, right? And um, hey, pants mean something different in this country. <laughs> Wait, what do pants it means mean? Underwear. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> they only had they only had one pair of <laughs> pants underwear for the whole country. Uh, that, that, that um, so you know, I think he likes his nice you know suits and and the Mercedes that drive him around. Um, he enjoys that, and uh, so do his buddies, right? So um, I don't think he's nostalgic for the Soviet Union, but um, there's there are um, kind of askolki, um, fragments, fragments of kind of Soviet rhetoric that have remained with him, and um, he. Uh, and one of the things is that he still he still thinks of Russia as a multi-ethnic state, right? And it's great. Right, you just don't hear. You just he just doesn't have this. Partly because he was raised in the Soviet Union, he really doesn't have this kind of Russian nationalist. It's projected onto him a lot, right? Um, uh, but whereas Navalny, maybe yeah, is a bit more problematic. Yeah, than he's well, he's um, he's not as Soviet, right? Um, he's kind of a new man. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, you know, so, yeah, so his, his rhetoric remains, you know, when he kind of talks about this stuff, it's, it's, it is, he thinks of Russia as a multi-ethnic place. And I think that help, it matters, right? I mean, I, 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 I do think rhetoric has some impact. Yeah. I just wanted to check the Russian slang word that you used for um, uh, an uneducatedly nostalgic person about the Soviet Union. Was it Savok? Savok. S-O-L-O-K. S-O-V-O-K. Savok. Savok, sorry, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. S-O-V-O-K. Yes. Savok. What's the uh, etymology? It's a dustpan. It's, it's a dustpan. It's okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah, it means a dustpan. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Nove slova для меня. Okay. Savok. Спасибо. Right next to you. Um, well, I, I was just wondering, um, w one of the uh, categories of, of my countrymen that I always um, bowled over by are all the people who sort of when speaking about corruption and the injustices in Russia, they take this position, and I don't know how genuine it is, of, well, if I had a chance to steal, if I had a chance to take over that factory, to send my kids to a British boarding school, etc., I do it and good on them. And one of the things that I find really sad about that perspective is that then people who haven't done that look around and think, you know, I suck because I, you know, I haven't stolen enough and I'm not part of the, um, you know, I'm not a local official, you know, sort of with a Ferrari or whatever it is they have. And I was just wondering where the people like that fit in in your way of thinking about sort of what Russians want and what versus what they got and where they should head. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I th you know, I think, it, again, this is about the kind of post-Soviet transition, right? I mean, this is, for years, um, people were told that, you know, things were one way, that the, the capitalist West was evil, right? Uh, that it was corrupt, um, that it was aggressive, right? And um, some of that stuff wasn't true. <laughs> um, uh, but then in a very short period of time, um, uh, it was suddenly, suddenly they were told, oh, that was all, that was all a lie. You know, all of it was a lie. Actually, it's, it's everything, everything is the opposite of what we said. You know, everything, right? And so um, you very quickly developed, um, I mean, you, you really had a kind of collapse of all values, right? Um, and it did, I mean, I think a lot of people, uh, the message that they got from the West was, yeah, you have to take you have to take what you what you can, right? Um, this idea that we must share, <laughs> that we should be equal, that was baloney, right? Uh, we're now an opposite world, um, and you, you have to take. And if you don't, you you lose. You're a loser, and you deserve to be left behind. I mean, that really was the ethos, um, and it remains the ethos um, of post-Soviet Russia. And that's not 
that's not Soviet. <laughs> that's not a Soviet ethos. So yeah, that's uh, that's very sad, and and I think um, that ha I think there's a lot of work to to be done. I mean, I think that's when you kind of talk when when Russians talk about it, they talk about um, you know we we need to really do kind of moral and kind of political work on ourselves. <laughs> and um, you know, one of the nice things is there's still this. Um, there is this kind of remnant um, uh, of kind of a, a Soviet ethos, right, here and there, um, in, the, in the kind of good way. Um, there's, also, there's also Stalinists, right? Um, uh, but there are, you know, you go to these towns, you go to these kind of mono towns. I had the experience of going to a place called, um, oh, I'm going to forget it, but it, um, they were a mono town that was about to be shut down by Zidipaska. Uh, it was an oligarch in the, near St. Petersburg, and they had blocked the road, and um, and they, they, were making, um, they were making some kind of uh, fertilizer up there. And the whole town was built, you know, was kind of organized around this factory. And I went up there for a day, and it was very interesting because they, um, you know, it was just, it was, they had these five-story houses built in the, you know, 60s, the Khrushchevki. Um, everybody was walking around with their baby carriages, right? Um, the, we went to see the head of the kind of union that had been agitating, um, you know, against the closure of the factory, and her assistant was there, and he kind of was in the meeting for half an hour, and then he's like, "Oh, sorry, I got to go. We have a soccer game, you know, against like the other part of the factory." <laughs> um, and I was like, "Wow, like this actually, the Soviet Union has has survived here." Um, and it was actually, one of the interesting um, Tony Wood, who some of you may know about, he's an LRB um, New Left Review contributor. Um, his argument has been that the kind of re the remains of the Soviet Union have actually kind of subsidized um, the capitalist transformation, right? Um, that the you know the kind of all the infrastructure that was built, all the oil that was found, um, this has actually paid for a lot of um, has given kind of time um, to to the Russian state that it would not otherwise have had, um, but that that time may be running out. Um, Anyway, so yes, yeah, so I feel like uh, you know it's a huge mistake, and kind of my friend, it's a huge mistake to dismiss the Soviet past. Um, um, and and kind of my friends on the Russian left, who are partly described in this book, um, uh, you know, they their goal is to kind of find the usable, the usable past in the Soviet past. Um, so I, I hope they succeed. One over here. Uh, so when you look to the the Soviet future, how would you compare the the Khorodovsky vision to the Abramovich and maybe the Putin vision? And which of those would you say is closer to the Soviet past? Uh, n none. I mean, um, by the Khodorkovsky vision, do you mean like, um, what, what exactly do you mean? Well, I guess one is close to the state and the other one was preaching Sorry, openness of a kind. Oh, I can't hear you. Can you speak? Uh, one was close to the state and the other was preaching openness of a kind. Um, yeah, I, would, I, would, I think I would argue there's a, that's a distinction without a difference, really. Um, that um, I don't think Khodorkov, I don't think the oligarch Khodorkovsky um, was an answer, um, you know, any better answer than than the statist Putin, right? Um, you know, in a in a way, um, you know, uh, um, well, it's complicated, but but you know, uh, I, I don't think I don't think uh, Putin should have put Khodorkovsky in prison. Um, uh, but I do think it was important that uh, the oligarchs start paying their taxes, right? Um, so, um, I, you know, yeah, uh, a person who had um, basically uh, taken a lot of Soviet oil um, and used it to become a billionaire um, and then uh, became a great advocate of openness <laughs> and and freedom. Um, I th I think as a person that we can be skeptical of. Um, I mean, he served his time, so uh, I have I respect that. But but uh, no, neither of those is, is the answer to the question. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, there's, there's some up here. Uh, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Over here. Um, thanks for a really fascinating book. Uh, you mentioned earlier that one of the uses of fiction was condensing like a decade of your experience into six months. Um, but I was wondering what the other uses of fiction are for you. Like this could have been an extended essay, it could have been a memoir, but it's not. Uh -huh. You've done a lot of journalism. Why a novel? Or why um, this? For this. Yeah, project. thank you. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to uh, write a book while I was over there. I, I, I didn't. Um, I was just kind of trying to figure out how to help my grandmother. <laughs> um, and I was doing some journalism. And then um, I got back and I, um, I was like, wow, that was a very intense experience. You know, I'd, I'd been sort of, we'd lived together for a year. We were kind of trapped in this little apartment. Um, we, we'd have these conversations that were very repetitive um, because she couldn't hear and she couldn't remember, right? So we'd have a conversation and then five minutes later we'd have the same conversation, you know? And um, it took a long time to kind of figure out how to deal with that. And, and when I started writing, um, and so, so when I started writing, I, I, I kind of thought I'd write a memoir, right? And I kind of wrote it down as a memoir-y type thing. Um, and then I found that it hadn't actually communicated what I wanted to communicate, and, and it was boring. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so I started changing some things um, just to make it more, just to make it make more sense. <laughs> um, you know, in a way, like, your, your life, you know, the book takes place over the course of a year, right? And life is kind of longer than that and messier than that. Um, and taking a kind of year-long chunk of your life isn't always going to make a, a narrative sense. Um, I mean, one of the things that I did that uh, changed the book a, a lot, I think, to the better, I mean, initially the guy was a kind of journalist and translator, um, more like me, and that was really boring for me, even though I, I, I like it when other people, you know, kind of dispense with the fictional scaffolding and just say, you know, I am Sheila Hetty, um, a writer, right? I, I like that. But um, when I said, I am Keith Gesson, uh, um, that was boring. Um, and uh, so I, I made him an academic, and that became a lot more fun. <laughs> and um, I got to make fun of, um, you know, Russian academics. It was, it was a great time. Um, I had to cut some of that stuff out because I was having too good a time. Um, well, will uh, you reveal later who Fishman is? Sorry? Will you reveal later who he is? I will later okay. reveal. No, no, uh, he's a made-up <laughs> character. Um, yeah, Alex Fishman is, um, is actually one of the few characters in the book who has no basis in any one person. Uh, but he's a villain. He's the, he's the uh, narrator's uh, main um, kind of enemy in academia. Um, and uh, many people have come up to me and said, I know who Fishman is. <laughs> um, it's this person. Is it this person? And I'm like, no, I don't know that person. Uh, but I've learned a lot of people. I learned There's a lot of Fishmans out there. Um, I, and I know their names. Um, uh, yeah, so, so stuff like that made it more interesting. And then, I mean, the main thing was um, and, you know, and I was able to, once I realized that the, all these arguments about Russian capitalism and, and kind of all the stuff that I want, had been trying to say as a journalist for many years, and nobody cares, <laughs> um, that the grandmother actually, that her story um, was the best argument um, against capitalism that I could make. Um, and once I figured out that the, the book could really concentrate on her story, um, it got a lot better, and um, and the other thing that you know had happened in my life um, was I you know I'd spent a year there and then I'd left and I kind of had there were just all these reasons I was going to leave and my visa had run out and stuff um, but it felt to me like I had abandoned my grandmother right I I just left her there to die um, and when I wrote it down as it actually happened it didn't that was not communicated. Um, and in order to make the reader feel <laughs> like this person had abandoned his grandmother, um, I had to make some stuff up and, and make it sharper, right? Um, and now I think it does basically communicate what I felt, right? But in order to do that, I had to change the, mm -hmm. the facts. So that's, I find that interesting, but yeah, thank you. Maybe, that's yeah, one more maybe? Yeah, last one. Um, 
I'm interested in the role that women play in your book. I love the book, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, and Grandma seems to be the strongest, most resilient person in the book, far stronger than the women of subsequent generations. Do you think that the role of women in modern Russia has gone backwards since the end of the revolution, uh, since the end of the Soviet <laughs> Union, not revolution, the Soviet, since the end of the Soviet Union? Do you think that Grandma was somehow created by a Soviet Russia and that now we are in a perhaps more misogynistic Russian culture? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, um, women um, under the, so there was a kind of rhetoric of equality um, under the Soviets. There was also a kind of necessity of equality um, after the Civil War. Um, a lot of men died, um, so you needed women in the workforce. And and during the, the World War II, you know, even more men died, um, and so you really needed women in the workforce. So there was a kind of um, a necessity and a kind of ideology that were married um, in you know genuinely a lot of women in leadership roles um, in a society that otherwise was. I mean, it was kind of like you know the. The woman in the household, you know, had a real, you know, an important job. She was the director of a factory, an institute, and then she still had to come home and cook and take care of the kids, right? So uh, it was a real double shift, right? But but um, but she was the director of the institute, right? Um, so um, yeah, I mean, and in the kind of post-Soviet period, uh, one of the things that happened was a lot of these. Um, a lot of these kind of institutes that um, had women in leading roles were wiped out, right? And it was a much more um, the kind of role of violence in Russian society increased. Um, the kind of capacity to deploy violence became uh, very important if you were to advance in kind of Russian business and society, and, and that was dominated by men, and a certain kind of men. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, and yeah, I, I, I'm very glad you said that about the grandmother. It's, you know, for me, there was a kind of, um, um, and I was talking about this with Henrietta, who's here, um, yesterday, uh, the, you know, um, there's a kind of, I think there's an ethical kind of quandary about writing about somebody who's going through dementia, right, and their personality changes. Um, and, you know, are you describing a person who's not actually that person? Um, you know, it so happens that my grandmother um, had always been really pessimistic. <laughs> um, so when she was going through this, I mean, she became more pessimistic, um, but she'd always been that way. Um, and I have really, um, one of the most, most satisfying things about the book's publication has been reading kind of reviews and comments about the grandmother, who is basically my grandmother, um, and people saying, you know, what a funny, um, you know, angry, bitter, <laughs> pessimistic person, strong. you know, strong and strong, yeah, yeah, and I mean, indomitable. I mean, she, um, uh, she, she was, you know, she couldn't hear, she couldn't remember, she, was, she got tired very easily, but she really wanted to be involved. Um, and she really, I mean, that was kind of what I learned at the end of the year is that she just wanted to be in contact with people, you know, and that's, that was kind of what I could do for her. So, um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's been a lot of fun. Great. Um, I thought thank you, you didn't all for want coming. more questions, but maybe you do. No, no, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> let's, uh, thank you very much for coming.